Okay, I think we're good to go ahead and get started. Uh, again, my name is Mark Leggett. I'm the Executive Director for Research Data Canada. And together with colleagues at uh, the Portage uh, Network, uh, we're co-hosting today's webinar, a mini symposium uh, in actuality, the trust principles in the Canadian context. And this is uh, a follow on from the trust webinar that RDC hosted uh, a month or two ago. Um, so we're happy to be able to uh, take a little bit of a Canadian view on these new emerging principles, or as I like to call them, sibling principles to uh, the fair principles that we're all quite familiar with. Uh, next slide, please, Robin. Um, and next slide. So this is our agenda for today. So I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes highlighting how we're going to deal with the questions and answer piece. Uh, and then uh, our colleague is going to come in and talk about the trust principles in a general, uh, general context. And then uh, we'll have two colleagues that are going to speak to implementing trust in the fair landscape, both of them uh, working in the Canadian repository uh, community. Uh, and then two other colleagues will come and speak to the Canadian landscape. And then we're going to take a 15 minute break, assuming that we things all work uh, on time and we're actually able to uh, to get things uh, uh, done by 2.15. Um, I may toy with that break a bit, depending on how things go. After that, we're going to have a half hour panel discussion with uh, four colleagues. And the last half hour is devoted to responding to questions. Uh, next slide. So just on the questions part, so to make it easier, because depending on how uh, the individual speakers go, we may or may not have time uh, to ask questions after each of the sessions. I will certainly do my best to do that. Uh, I may well cue the questions to bring them up in the final half hour session or insert them into the panel discussion. Um, so if you could please use the Q&A if you do have questions for our speakers and panelists, that will allow me to keep them straight from uh, more operational technical challenge type questions uh, that may be posed uh, in the chat window. So the Q&A button is at the bottom of your bar. Uh, so please use that for questions. It also helps us uh, move questions off into the answered column uh, once they are. Uh, there's also an interpretation function. Uh, so today all of our speakers will be speaking in English, uh, but we do have uh, two French translators, uh, Tess and Pierre, uh, who are available to uh, provide the translation for today's uh, session. Uh, so if you click on the interpretation button, you can uh, select the French channel and you will get a simultaneous French translation. Uh, uh, we will, uh, as I said earlier, uh, for those that had logged in earlier, uh, we weren't able to get the French deck uh, translated in time for the session today, but we will distribute that to all registered uh, attendees. And it will also be made available together with the English deck once the final uh, audio video of the webinar is made available. Uh, so with that, next slide. So I'd like to introduce uh, our first speaker, uh, Ingrid Dillo. Uh, Ingrid, uh, I have the pleasure of working with Ingrid on a regular basis uh, in our role as co-chairs of the Research Data Alliance. Um, when she's not doing her RDA stuff, Ingrid is the deputy director at the Donalds uh, Institute. So that's the Data Archiving and Network Services uh, organization in the Netherlands. Um, as I mentioned, Ingrid's also a co-chair and counsel and very active in RDA, she's also a member of the board of Core Trust Seal, uh, which we'll hear more about today, and vice chair of the scientific committee of the ISC World Data System, or WDS. Uh, so very active in uh, in all of the things that you're going to hear about today. And uh, Ingrid is also project coordinator of the European project known as Fair is Fair, uh, which is doing a lot of great work uh, along the lines of the fair principles and uh, intersecting with some of the things that you're going to hear about today. So Ingrid, with that, I will pass it over to you. Thank you very much, Mark, and thank you for the kind introduction. And good afternoon to all of you. 
Well, after so many virtual events, it would really be nice uh, to meet you face to face and to be in one uh, room with you. Um, but unfortunately, I'm speaking to you from my home office in a town called Alphen aan de Rijn in the Netherlands, not far from Leiden. Um, so I will kick off this mini symposium with an overview of the trust principles. And for those of you who joined the earlier webinar, um, I warn you that there will be some repetition, so I apologize in advance for that. Next slide. Oh, one back, please. Yeah, thanks. So um, the importance, of course, of, of open science, science is now generally um, acknowledged around the globe. Um, many policy documents have been written on the topic by funders, by national governance, by international organizations. And, and you see here on the screen a couple of very important elements that um, we need in order to achieve real open science. Of course, a very important component is um, the research itself. Uh, we need transparent research practices, open access publishing, of course, you will recognize, and um, data sharing and data reuse is also a very important component of open science. And in Canada, uh, there is that same vision of making science open to all. You published um, a roadmap for open science earlier this year. And um, that roadmap, I had a look at it, that provides overarching principles and recommendations to guide the open science activities in Canada. Next slide. Next slide, yeah, thanks. And if you look, no, one back. <laughs> if you look at those five overarching principles, I believe that the trust principles that we're going uh, to talk about today um, align very nicely with most of them. The trust principles are really an instrument designed to facilitate the discussion on trust with all stakeholders. And they speak um, very much um, to the people and the collaboration principles of your open science plan. And the inclusiveness principle in that plan is very much related, I think, to the user focus principle that we have in the trust principles. And finally, both transparency and sustainability are part of both sets of principles. So I see a very nice alignment there between um, the way that you in Canada look at open science and the basic elements of that and how we look at the trustworthiness of digital repositories in those, in those trust principles. Next slide. So if everyone, um, policymakers and funders are so convinced of the importance of open science, then it would surely be the case that the, the, the um, cartoon that you see on the left hand side, uh, where you have the ivory tower with researchers saying the data are mine is a scene from the past by now, and that data would now be um, available uh, free for the picking. Next slide. Um, but if you look at, at it from a perspective of the researchers, um, the situation is still quite different and um, researchers have a lot of concerns around data sharing and, and data reuse. And here you see <clears throat> one of the results from an international survey among researchers that was done last year. And you can see that um, the main worries that people have concern uh, misuse of their data by others. Um, uncertainty about copyright and licensing, and also a fear that they will not receive uh, the appropriate credit for the work that they put in. So it's quite clear from this that trust in all sorts of ways and disguises seems to be the biggest barrier for sharing data. Next slide. And this really is, is nothing new. Um, I think this was already quite nicely pointed out in a report that was published many years ago in 2014 by RDA Europe. And in the report, it was stated that perhaps the biggest challenge in sharing data is trust. How do you create a system robust enough for scientists to trust that if they share their data, their data won't be lost, garbled, stolen or misused? And that element of trust is very central here. But it also speaks about a system, a system that is needed 
And that relates um, in my mind to another angle from which you can look at data sharing. Next slide. So here you see um, another nice quote uh, from one of the members of the Core Trust Seal Board who states that research data will not become nor stay fair by magic. We need skilled people, transparent processes, interoperable technologies and collaboration to build, operate and maintain research data infrastructures. So here she really defines, defines that whole system that we need in order to make and keep data fair. So make and keep those data shareable and reusable. So it's very important to, to, to see that we need that whole complex and that we need the stakeholders involved and especially the researchers to also have trust in that system. Next slide. So we hear of course a lot about the fair principles and about fair data, but it's very important to remember that you need more than the data themselves. Here you see on the left-hand side of the slide, a couple of the metrics that have been defined under the different FAIR principles. So for example, if you look at the findable principle, there's a metric on um, the availability of persistent identifiers and on the fact that metadata and data should be registered or indexed in a searchable resource, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if you look at those metrics, they clearly show dependencies with the data infrastructure in which the data, the digital objects live, where they are managed and where they are preserved. So for example, um, when it comes to the persistence and resolvability of identifiers or the indexing in those searchable resources or the provision and support of standards, all of that needs more, can't be taken care of within the data set itself. And furthermore, data repositories also provide all kinds of, you could say, procedures like uh, retention policies and, and expert data curation. And also, of course, the long-term preservation that is needed to maintain the fairness of data objects. So all of these dependencies really mean that you need a whole fair data ecosystem with all kinds of components to make sure that the data remain fair over time. And that ecosystem is, is um, depicted on the right-hand side of this slide. And the repositories play a very important role there. Next slide. So to my mind, fair and trust are a perfect couple. Like I said, we need to share data um, in order to turn open science to reality. And the FAIR principles on the one hand help us to define, you could say, um, a high quality and transparent research data management practice. So that is one part of the story. The other part is that the trust principles and their implementations, and we will hear more about that later on, those principles help us to create trust in the research data infrastructure, in that ecosystem that we need in order to make sure that the data remain accessible and accessible over a very long period of time. Next slide. So going back now um, to the, the perspective of the researcher. You are a researcher, you are convinced that um, data sh the sharing of your data is a, is a good thing to do, then where do you go? So if you look at, for example, the Leafy Data Registry, which shows you all the repositories that are available around the globe, you have the choice of almost 2,600 repositories. So finding the right one for your data set seems to become um, the proverbial um, needle in the haystack. Next slide. So who can you trust? Well, of course, um, as an organization, um, but also as a person, it's always good if you get an external acknowledgement of your trustworthiness. You see that researchers really look at the reputation of a repository amongst their peers. For other stakeholders like funders or publishers, very often third party endorsements are important, for example, from um, certification bodies. But of course, it's also very important for um, the trustee itself 
to show um, elements um, upon which uh, people can base their trust in your organization. And then you can think of elements like integrity, transparency, competence, predictability, um, your positive intentions, et cetera, et cetera. I don't think that um, trust in individuals is that different from trusting organizations. Next slide. So then, um, how, um, in, in that sense, um, those, those, those elements really come back also in the trust principles and the trust principles provide um, a kind of guidance for repositories to achieve that trust, uh, trustworthiness. Um, so now a little bit more close, uh, uh, let's have a closer look at those trust principles themselves. How did they um, come about? They are really the result of a community effort. And I think I can't stress that enough. This is really something that emerged uh, bottom up. And the umbrella for that was the Research Data Alliance. Um, a couple of people within the Core Trust Seal Board started off the discussion on, on, on defining, uh, possibly defining principles like this. And that discussion was taken under the wings of the interest group of certificate on repository certification in RDA. And um, over the course of two plenary uh, conferences of the RDA, there were a lot of discussions in that group and a trust white paper was produced on the basis of those discussions. And over a period, no, over a period we had a couple of um, community consultations and re received many public comments on uh, the work that we did. And in the end, all of that resulted um, and was transformed into a paper in Nature Scientific Data. And that paper was written by 19 co-authors. And this was a very nice and diverse um, group of people. Uh, the people involved came from four continents, eight countries, and represented a very diverse stakeholder group. And we also represented very uh, different scientific domains. So all in all, that was a very firm and, 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 and diverse basis for this, uh, for this community effort. At the same time, we also got input from um, um, a trust workshop that we organized at the NIH. And of course, we had already the RDC Canada webinar. Next slide. So here you see uh, once again um, in a timeline uh, the work uh, and the steps that we took, the work that we did to, to come to the trust principles. And you can see that it um, all in all took, I think, um, one and a half year. And um, from several versions of the white paper, we finally ended up with uh, the publication of the trust principles in nature um, scientific data. Next slide. So what were the motivations behind the principles? The principles are really very high level and they are primarily meant to facilitate the discussion on these topics among stakeholders and also to guide repositories in the right direction to achieve trustworthiness. And it's very important to stress that the principles are by no means meant to replace any standards or criteria or best practices. They really are the level above um, those um, standards and, and criteria and practices. And in a way we have done a kind of backwards engineering if you compare it to the FAIR principles, because the FAIR principles started off with the FAIR principles themselves. And after that, we have seen over the last years, all kinds of implementations and criteria and, and best practices and tools developing from the principles. But with um, the trust principles, it's a bit the other way around. We already have certification mechanisms and best practices, but we have tried to define this higher level above all of that in order to facilitate that discussion. Next slide. So here again, I'm not diving into this, um, this overview in detail, but it shows you um, that we already have quite a, a crowded landscape of, of different um, certification mechanisms and frameworks and models. And over time, um, we have um, taken different steps and different um, methods and, and assessment tools um, appeared. 
and sometimes also disappeared because a core trust seal, we are going to hear more about that, is in fact a merger of two uh, predecessors, the um, certification requirements of the World Data System and the Data System of Approval. Next slide. So what exactly do those principles tell us? Here you see uh, them again. Um, so trust stands for transparency, responsibility, user focus, sustainability, and technology. And again, the trust principles are focused on repositories, whilst um, their sibling FAIR principles are focused on the data, on the data set. Next slide. So um, since um, the publication of the principles, I think it was in May, um, we have already seen um, um, a lot of impact. Um, so uh, there is the possibility for organizations to endorse um, the trust principles, and this can be done um, on the RDA website. And you can see here that already over 30, 30 um, organizations have done so. And that is really wonderful news. And next slide, we also see that um, there is a lot of interest in the trust principles. So the uh, article is doing very well when it comes to the attention score. And you can also see on the map um, that the trust principles have been picked up in different parts of the world. Um, and that is also great news. And I think that is also um, the added value that um, undertaking such, a, such an initiative under the umbrella of RDA brings you. Next slide. So let's quickly go through the different um, letters, through the different principles. So the T stands for transparency. Transparency includes the organizational transparency on the one hand and the data transparency on the other. And I personally believe that transparency is really vital, critical to trustworthiness. Um, you need to be open, completely open of what you can do as an organization, what you can deliver, but also what you cannot deliver. And it's better to be open and transparent about that than um, not to show um, and do promises that you can't keep. So key concepts in under this principle are um, that you need to have um, a good terms of use, that you need to offer a minimum digital uh, preservation timeframe for the data holdings and um, that you, in some cases, if you handle, uh, for example, sensitive data, that you also need to show that you have uh, the capacity um, to take that responsibility. Next slide. If you look at responsibility, um, it is clear that as a repository, you are responsible for the authenticity and the integrity of the data over time and also for the reliability and the persistence of your services. And very key to that is that you also adhere to um, what um, is relevant to your designated community in terms of metadata, in terms of curation standards, et cetera, et cetera. Um, another very important component is that you manage the intellectual property rights of your data producers and that you again protect sensitive information and um, also the security of the system, of course, is very important. You need to take responsibility for that as well. And then if we go to the next letter, the U standing for user focus um, is the middle letter eh, in the trust word. And um, that is also very symbolic because um, in the end, um, the user needs to be central in everything that the repository does. Um, it should follow the norms uh, of its community or the communities that it serves. And it should comply also with the expectations that that community has. So the repository should really be focused on its de designated um, community. Um, and again, there are a couple of key concepts um, that um, are mentioned in this uh, framework, like um, the importance of implementing relevant data metrics and making them available to users, um, providing community catalogs for uh, the recover discovery of the data, 
and also very important to also monitor the developments within your community and the expectations that people have and respond to them in um, um, the services that you provide. From the U, we go to the S, the S that stands for sustainability. Next slide. And this, of course, is about the long term sustainability of uh, the data holdings themselves, but also of the services and even of the organization and the repository itself. And key concept um, when it concepts when it comes to um, the organization, for example, are um, uh, the need for a business continuity plan, um, disaster recovery plans, succession plans, etc. A very other another very important aspect, of course, is um, the sustainable funding that needs to be available in order to uh, create long term sustainability. And of course, it's also about providing um, governance for um, the long term preservation of the data so that they uh, remain discoverable and accessible um, also in the future. And then finally, we have the T standing for technology. So the data and the services uh, need to be supported by an infrastructure that guarantees the persistence and reliability of the services. And infrastructure here is not only technology, uh, and then I refer again to the quote that I showed you about that whole system. It's also very much, of course, about the people and the processes within the repository. Next slide. So I think um, I have given you a quick overview, hopefully, of, of the trust principles and uh, how they came about and how you can place them in the wider context, both of the FAIR principles and of the whole discussion around open science and, and data sharing. And I'd like to end with, uh, with acknowledging, again, the input of, of so many people that have been involved in this community effort. And finally, uh, a very special thanks um, to my colleague, Dawei Lin, who you will hear later on today, for allowing me to build on this slide deck. So thank you very much. Thanks, Ingrid. And I know we, we were, you've kept us on time, so I'm tempted to uh, pose this one question that's in the chat, which I believe Dawei is typing a response to, but you may want to give it a try live. Uh, minimum preservation time. Oh, no, he's answered the question. <laughs> it's just disappeared from my screen. So, <laughs> well, he will no, undoubtedly have given a very good answer. I trust <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, Ingrid. And uh, as I said at the top, uh, if anybody does have any uh, questions, please feel free to uh, type them into the chat. Uh, sorry, the Q and A, uh, and we will do our best to uh, to insert them at the appropriate time. Uh, okay, so I'd like to now introduce our uh, next speaker. Uh, so we have two speakers that we have lined up to provide the Canadian context, um, and they're both uh, colleagues who work in uh, specific domains and are working actively working with uh, trusted uh, research infrastructure, including data repositories. So our first uh, speaker is Raina Jenkins, and Raina is the data stewardship manager at Ocean Networks Canada in Victoria. She's been closely involved in metadata management, data acquisition, expedition support, and interoperability initiatives at Ocean Networks Canada for more than a decade. She is active within the research data management community through working groups and committees, including as a board member of the Core Trust Seal. Uh, she received her Bachelor of Mathematics in Applied Math from the University of Waterloo and her Master of Science in Ocean Physics at the University of Victoria. Uh, so Raina, I will pass it over to you. Thanks, Mark. So I'll be covering basically two topics in my presentation today, um, a little bit about the Core Trust Seal and as well about how we are implementing some of the trust principles at Ocean Networks Canada. So next slide. So just some context. I know uh, Ingrid gave you uh, one slide where it sh showed a bit of a timeline about the different certification. Um, but just to highlight, uh, it was basically the data seal of approval and the world data system, which had their own um, certification processes for repositories um, that came together um, a number of years back within the Research Data Alliance Working Group to um, 
to merge those principles and to come out with something better. And so it was in 2017, three years ago, when the core trust deal emerged um, as an amalgamated approach to doing these uh, uh, certified repositories. So in that framework, there's 16 requirements, which are um, the repository that's applying would self-assess themselves with their responses. Um, and then that would be reviewed by uh, two members of the Quarter Seal community. Um, and, and if there is some uh, answers that need some clarification, they'll go back and there'll be a chance for some back and forth um, for the app applicant to revise their, their content. Um, but all these applications, once they make it through and are, are actually publicly available, which is a great resource if you're about to apply or thinking about applying, um, there is a fee, $1,000 euros, but um, this, this is not a make money organization. This just helps cover the basic costs. Um, it's really reliant on the in-kind contributions made from the board members and also all the reviewers. Um, so each, each requirement as you're um, going through the process, there's a compliance level um, from zero through four, and you must be at three or four in order to actually um, end up with the certification, but, or not applicable in some cases, but um, that, that's, that's rare. Um, and then those compliances are either not applicable, um, the concept is not even considered yet, um, it's a theoretical concept um, you're implementing, or it's fully implemented. So it's basically you're looking for that um, the, the requirement is being implemented or already implemented. And just so you know, this has been mainly um, uh, allowing, uh, for the most part, domain repositories to become certified. And so there's actually a work in progress to look at um, offerings for either generalist repositories or just technical service providers to also gain certification. So this is an underway um, evaluation. And so I would expect to see something else coming uh, out in the next couple of months. Um, there has already been some community feedback opportunities. Um, so watch, watch for that. Next slide. And so just to give you um, a sense of these requirements, um, which are reviewed on a th every three years. And so we actually have uh, a new newer round of requirements that is effective till 2022. Um, and they're broken into kind of three areas. One is the organizational infrastructure, another is the digital object man management, and another is the te technology. Um, and if you actually did a mapping, you could map each of these 16 requirements to one of the trust principles or, or overlapping. Um, so that's, that's a bit of an exercise one can do. Um, but for each requirement, there's basically um, a short statement about what is that requirement. So I gave one example here about data integrity and authenticity. Um, and then uh, some guidance that's available for what is meant by that in more detail. And actually, if you're looking online at the Core Trust Seal website, there's even a more extended guidance, which goes into further uh, detail. So there's, there's quite a bit of information there about um, to guide the applicant and what is meant um, by that requirement. Next slide. So we are pleased also to announce uh, this fall that we did actually reach our 100th certified repository. Um, last I looked, um, and this might have changed, but uh, last I looked, we were actually at 101. Um, but, but this is a big milestone that we reached this fall. And so there was a press release. Um, and you can actually see the application online. Um, and this is just a screenshot showing um, a map of the uh, Quarto Seal repositories. Um, so yeah, at that point it was 101. So just after the, the big 100 that I took that. Next slide. And then as, as Ingrid was pointing out, um, Re3Data is a great way to find out about repositories um, that are available. Um, Quarto Seal does have um, an arrangement already with 3.3 data such that um, one can filter on uh, repositories that actually have the Quartra seal um, certification. So that's an option um, in their filter tools. Uh, if you go under certificates, there's you'll see the Quartra seal. Um, and as well, once you're on an individual repository page, I've, I've picked here the Australian Antarctic Data Center. Um, at the upper right, you can see all these little sort of badges and the one with the, the red circle um, filled circle is that's the Quartra seal um, badge. So um, whenever you're looking through there, you can easily find uh, which, which repositories have the Quartra seal. Next slide. 
So just to start to talk to you about what is Ocean Networks Canada doing, I'll just give you a bit of quick context about Ocean Networks. So for those of you that don't know, um, we operate um, uh, ocean observatories, uh, various platforms uh, off all the coasts of Canada, um, as well as we serve as a repository for uh, third party infrastructure and data sets uh, for in the ocean data realm. And so this, these maps just give you some, some idea about the, 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 the breadth of the infrastructure that we have, both fixed instruments on cabled arrays, uh, autonomous instruments, uh, mobile instruments, all types. So um, quite an quite a extensive um, archive that we're maintaining. Uh, next slide. So just uh, to highlight some, a little bit more of the core trust seal that um, that already was highlighted by Ingrid. Um, this is just a paragraph taken from the trust principles uh, paper. And, and you can really see that, um, you know, that, that fair data on its own um, is one thing, but you really need these trusted digital repositories to, to allow for these data sets to be preserved over time and to be um, there for the long term. And it really takes this, um, the repositories to really take that on uh, as their responsibilities to the community to, to make those data sets really um, serve their purpose. Um, and a number of years ago, there was actually an endorsement done for the FAIR principles, similar to what is now being done for the trust principles. Um, that was put out by the COPDES, uh, the Coalition for Publishing Data in the Earth and Space Science. Is. So that's another one that you can endorse, and ONC has endorsed that one. Um, so you can endorse both sets of principles that way. Um, and then uh, ONC itself was a certified repository through the World Data System um, back in 2014, and we're actually now working on our, our application to the CORTRA seal to renew that, that certification. Next slide. So I'm just giving some examples over the next few slides, one slide per each uh, principle, just to give you some of the ways that ONC is already um, meeting some of the trust principles or we're working on to enhance our alignments. So um, here we're talking about transparency. So we already have um, all kinds of user documentation for our various tools and interfaces of our Oceans 2.0, which is our digital infrastructure data portal and um, where we do all our data management. We have uh, device workflows, which are not only um, a way to ensure that we're consistent um, with all our instrument deployments and maintenance and recovery processes for data, but also um, these are available um, for anyone to see. Um, so they're publicly available um, workflows. Uh, so that's an added aspect of transparency. Uh, we have data agreements with our third party partners such that really outline um, what attributions will be um, disseminating with the data and if there are any restricted data um, concerns um, for sensitive data uh, that would be contained within that as well. And we've also recently implemented a data versioning framework which is going to be allowing us to give more provenance on when um, we make changes to the data why uh, we made those change changes and what was the extent of those changes. And then one thing we've also put a lot of um, uh, effort into is uh, our relationships with First Nations. And in doing so, we have a number of staff that has taken the OCAT principles as training. And this is something that more and more of our staff continue to take such that we can um, enhance our policies um, for those communities. Uh, so we are working on a revised data policy. Um, this question about licensing and sensitive data, this is coming up more and more. And so we're revising our data policy to help um, align with the more current practices. Um, and as well, we're always, um, you know, looking uh, to serve new data sets and types of instruments. So that's that's something that we're always continuing to work on. Next slide. So the next one is about responsibility. So here um, we've certainly done quite a bit, but um, uh, we make sure that all our data is discoverable, um, accessible, and uh, we also provide interfaces for annotation of the data by the public and also by our staff. Um, our data is available in non-proprietary formats where possible. And we are serving our metadata with the ISO 19115 uh, formats. Um, so 
Recently, we also added in um, data site DOIs and ROARs, and actually more on that topic will be next week in a webinar with Portage. So check that out um, if you're interested. And um, we do have most of our data public and open, but we do have some sensitive data concerns that um, for those data, they might be restricted. And in those cases, the metadata would still be public. Um, so we're always making enhancements to the tools. Right now, there's active uh, tool work going on for some of our passive acoustic and underwater video interfaces, um, but always more and more and hope to get in more persistent identifiers, um, improve the performance of our tools uh, for the data access. So this is a continued effort for sure. Okay, next slide. And the user focus. So here we, we really actually put a lot of emphasis on this at Ocean Networks Canada. We have, first of all, expert guidance coming in for our board of directors, our International Science Advisory Board, our Ocean Observatory Council. Um, we also do annual surveys to gauge what the community is thinking about our services and what we could do better. Um, we actually have a dedicated user services department with staff scientists that reach out um, to specific communities in the science. Um, um, and not only that, but we have our educators and our Indigenous relation um, staff so we're certainly trying to cover the gamut of all these different stakeholders that we serve. Um, and uh, wait, right now we're actually in an active process to figure out what is the next uh, decade going to look like for Ocean Networks Canada. And in doing so, there's been an expression of interest call that went out um, and now that's under review. Um, and that will really guide how we uh, continue to serve our community. Um, but the other thing is ONC is super involved in all kinds of working in expert groups, um, both for the research data management, um, but also in the science realm and, and in other areas as well. Um, so this is something that uh, we do pay a lot of attention to, um, make sure that we are um, always responding to the community and thinking about interoperability as well. Next slide. In terms of sustainability, well, um, of course, funding is always a challenge, but um, we've tried to secure ourselves with strong relationships with the various funders and stakeholders. Um, and so we recognized also early on that this serving of data is not necessarily enough. We've also taken to um, trying to transform that data into, into, into information and knowledge um, for the decision makers um, that we're trying to serve. Um, but we're also trying to make sure that our data is preserved um, and we're looking at, uh, we have risk registers that um, try to um, you know, look for any pitfalls in what we're doing in ways that we need to um, improve. So overall for sustainability, I think that we're doing fairly well, but the funding, uh, even though we're quite secure, it's always a continued challenge. And um, we're working on our final match funding for our last um, uh, award of the major science initiative funds right now. Next slide. And then the last one here is technology. So here, uh, the most of our technology is really wrapped up in our Oceans 2.0 in infrastructure, which handles all the data management, um, the data access, the data curation. Um, but there's also um, a host of other tools that we're using in the organization that we have to um, you know, keep that in mind. Uh, things like our ticket tracking system in Jira, um, where we store our documents in Alfresco. Um, all kinds of tools that we're using. Um, and then cybersecurity is also a big, um, a big topic, especially um, not only for our data, but also for our marine infrastructure. And so uh, there's this pretty strong uh, policies in place for that. Um, and then in progress, we have a number of things going on, but one thing is, you know, you always have to maintain that equipment. Um, and so we're, we're looking to uh, replace quite a bit of hardware in the next uh, year or so. Um, for those that are reaching end of life expectancies. So next slide. Um, so I just wanted to also highlight in a single slide here that ONC is also involved in the Canadian Integrated Ocean Observing System, which you may have heard about already. Um, I suggest looking at the Portage Network webinar that was recorded back in July, if you wanted to know a bit more about that. But in this arrangement, we're also trying to adhere to Trust principles, um, maybe not to the same extent with all the repositories getting certified, but we're keeping this in mind. So for instance, we have this common metadata profile 
um, we're, we're allowing the data access through this non-proprietary formats and uh, interoperable um, uh, web services of OpenDAP. Uh, the data policy, we're framing our data policy around the core trustee requirements to make sure that we at least acknowledge them all, even if we're not quite meeting them all. Um, and then we're recommending CC by licensing throughout, and they're also looking at the um, emerging traditional knowledge and biocultural labels for Indigenous partner data sets. So that's something we're evaluating and trying to see if that's um, going to be effective. Um, and then for interoperability, we're also looking to partner or, or to contribute data sets um, to the ocean biodiversity information system. So we're doing a number of activities there as well. So basically, um, I just wanted to thank everyone again for, for paying attention. And uh, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Thank you, Rena. And it's really nice to see the, the uh, adoption or recommending the use of the TK and BC labels. I think that's a really important way to ensure that the, the data that our infrastructures steward is uh, sensitive to Indigenous data uh, sovereignty. Um, we've had the pleasure of having translation from one of our translators, Tess. Uh, so thank you very much, Tess. Um, we have been having some technical difficulties, as you may have seen in some of the the public chat uh, context. Uh, so I'm actually going to uh, have to stop the translation. Uh, translating is a very taxi uh, taxing uh, activity, as you can well imagine. Um, and because of the technical difficulties, uh, we're going to have to move uh, to a single English track. So many apologies to our French colleagues who were taking part in the translation. Uh, but I guess that's the nature of uh, online virtual meetings and technology today. Um, our next speaker in this two-part series is uh, Brian Corey. Uh, Brian is the technical director for the iReceptor and iReceptor Plus projects. iReceptor is a platform for finding, searching, and analyzing genomics data from the adaptive immune receptor repertoire, uh, which he will talk about. And uh, iReceptor works closely with the AI AIRR community, which is what that uh, previous phrase uh, acronym is for, uh, to set standards for data sharing in this domain, and with the goal of establishing the AIRR Data Commons, a network of fair and trusted uh, AIRR standards compliant repos. And I should also add that Brian has been very active, or was an active participant in the Research Data Alliance COVID-19 guidelines and recommendations effort. So uh, Brian, over to you. Thanks, Mark. You can see my screen okay? Yes. Okay, so yeah, I'm gonna talk very briefly about the iReceptor platform, but this is mostly um, about our, I guess, our journey from fair to trust. We're not, um, I think we've reflected on the trust principles, um, but we have not gone down that uh, certification process. So it's more of a reflection on kind of where we're at um, today. I'm gonna start off a little bit with a background on Kind of the domain. So we're in the domain of immunogenetics, which is essentially the genetics of our immune system. Um, and I think this is very timely, obviously, um, because of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, of course. Uh, everybody's hearing about B cells and T cells and SARS-CoV-2 proteins and things like that. Well, that's the type of data that we're storing in our repositories. So basically, AirSeq data, the data that we store, are B cell and T cell receptors uh, of the immune response. And the goal of this research domain is basically about personalized immunotherapy. So help my immune system fight my disease. So um, uh, a typical vaccination is a very broad spectrum. Um, everybody gets the same vaccine. And the goal of personalized immunotherapy is that my system will help fight my disease. So it's a very personalized approach to, uh, to fighting disease. Um, one of the drivers of the problem that we're facing is there's this data deluge from next generation sequencing of the immune response. Um, normally, I would spend 10 to 15 minutes talking about this, but I'm just going to wrap uh, this up at a high level and say it's the data sets are very, very big. And the immune system and the immune response is very, very complicated and it's very hard to understand. And so I don't have time to go into the details. But I think one of the important things to point out is that for researchers to do uh, research, they can't just use the data that they generate their, uh, on their own. They need to be able to reuse data from other researchers to derive new insight. 
and that's uh, where the fair principles come in. And I think we've been um, involved in working around the fair principles for some time in this domain. So how do we do this? So the iReceptor approach is essentially, we have a web portal called the iReceptor Gateway. It's basically an interactive web portal. Instead of uh, searching a single repository, what it does is it searches what we call the Air Data Commons. This is a distributed set of repositories. Um, those repositories are based on standards developed by the international air community, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, and basically our web portal hides the complexity of finding, searching and federating data. The way it does that is the gateway basically sends out queries to these repositories, um, federates data on behalf of the researcher that meets uh, their complex scientific queries and provides a concise summary of that data. So it's basically a, a, a data exploration platform. So how does that fit into the trust world? Well, our, our gateway um, obviously relies on fair data. Data has to be findable and reusable for our platform to work. And of course, the more trusted those repositories are, um, the more trusted our platform is going to be. Now, in addition to that, iReceptor operates um, fair and trusted repositories as part of the Air Data Commons. So we, also, we both provide a scientific gateway, a web portal that searches these repositories but we also provide actually a couple of repositories themselves. And I'm gonna be talking mostly about those repositories and their um, trust characteristics. So one of the important things I think to point out, and I think, um, I think Ingrid kind of pointed this out as well, um, that trust requires a very, very strong community. And we're really, really fortunate uh, in the adaptive immune response repertoire community. Um, and, 2015, essentially, the community came together and decided they need to provide a solution to some of these really big data sharing uh, problems. And so there's this grassroots community. Currently, it's on the order of 150 researchers. Um, and it has a set of extremely active working groups. I'm not going to really talk about them in too much detail. But I think it's really important to point out that this community is both international in nature. So we have researchers that are from Germany, uh, France, Australia the US, um, the UK, so it's a very international community. And I think because of the interest in um, the adaptive immune system and its uh, importance in vaccines, um, it's also actually a very, very active, we have a very active community from the industry as well, which I think is, is kind of uh, relatively unique. So the air community basically sets standards um, and it's those standards that really we rely on to be fair and trustworthy. Um, and these working groups essentially develop these standards. So the minimal standards working group has developed a, a minimal metadata standard for sharing their seek data. Uh, the data representations working group has made a file, or created a file format. Um, the common repository working group has developed a narrative commons API. And these, um, these papers have been published, but they're not published as papers um, by individuals. They're actually published as papers from the air community. And so the air community actually has a uh, endorsement process. So the papers are written by the working groups. The working groups basically submit those to the air executive. The air executive sends those out to the air community and gets endorsements. So the papers have you know, 10 or 15 authors but they're actually publicly endorsed by researchers, a uh, large number of researchers across the entire community. Um, the example of that is the minimal standard, uh, which was developed by the minimal standards working group. Um, and it was published two years after the community was established. And it basically had 84 researchers sign on as public endorsements. Um, so they were basically uh, included as not quite as co-authors, but the actual publication actually published the list of people that actually endorsed the, the paper. So these are, have, have a, a broad community support. So now I'm gonna dive into a little bit more about the AIR repositories and whether they're trustworthy. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the repositories and how we work. So we are a network of distributed set of repositories so we are able to scale data sets to be very large because we have multiple repositories around the world. Um, each of those repositories can be of substantial size, but we also uh, scale out our 
repository. So we run the, a repository called the iReceptor Public Archive or IPA. And we currently have over 1.8 billion sequence annotations from 24 different studies in that repository. And that's spread across um, five different repositories internally. So it's a cluster of repositories essentially. So as we add more data, we just add more IPAs. And I use a beer theme here, of course, because I'm rather fond of IPAs. Um, in addition, over the last uh, year or last six months, really, um, so as I mentioned, we are storing essentially B cell and T cell data of the immune response. There's been a, a fairly uh, large, obvious number of studies that have been producing data from COVID-19 studies. So since June of two, 2020, um, we've also uh, curated uh, in collaboration with the ERA community, um, data from uh, 16 COVID-19 studies um, from a thousand or almost 2000 subjects and samples and over 740 million sequences. And those are spread over currently four repositories. So that's the fundamental kind of data that we have and we store. So now onto the trust principles. Um, so right now, so I'm gonna start, I'm gonna go through the, the letters as, as people do um, when they go through these kind of uh, these acronyms. Um, I'm gonna start at the back with technology because I Kind of feel that that one is the easiest at least the it's the easiest from my perspective as a as a computer scientist um, but we use kind of all the it best practices we use openstack for cloud resources we use docker containers we use compute canada Can, um, here in canada we're really lucky to have a resource like compute canada they have a cloud service we're heavy users of that cloud service to provide our infrastructure and we use best practices for security archival backup um, and we have performance monitoring to ensure service continuity and things like that. So the, the technical infrastructure and the, the people around that, that we have for supporting that, I think are fairly well established. I'm gonna then talk about the TRU part of trust um, because I think that is um, very much driven by the community aspects of the research community that we're involved with. So all of our standards come from the air community and it is that community that establishes all of the um, community level domain specific transparency and response responsibility characteristics. I think what I'm gonna focus on in the next couple of minutes is look at how does iReceptor as a research group um, provide more trust beyond what that community um, provides. So if you look at transparency, I think one of the key things around transparency um, for us at least is when we're talking about research data and how it is curated, the process and policies around that data curation are really, really important. And for, from a transparency perspective, it's really important that we provide enough metadata about the data we're storing in our repositories so researchers, researchers can make intelligent decisions as to whether or not that data is appropriate for them to reuse. Not all data is reusable for all purposes. And so researchers need um, a, a robust mechanism to store and curate the metadata around the studies. And you need clear processes and policies around those, that pro, uh, the curation process to make sure that researchers can understand what the data is and how it can be used. From a responsibility perspective, I think one of the really key things that, that we try to focus on is around data provenance. Uh, and so one of the key things that we wanna make sure, so data, data come from, we get data from studies and we put that in our repositories. Um, mistakes get made, um, data gets loaded incorrectly. Um, uh, an author might change some results. Um, what we find is really, really important. What we try to focus on is making sure that if data does change in our repositories, there is as clear of a path to understanding where that change happens. So if a, or if a researcher comes to our repository and searches for something one day, and then they come back another day and they find a difference in the data, they should be able to determine why there's a difference. And that is really, really critical for scientific reproducibility. On the user focus side, uh, our receptor gateway basically acts as a register registry for the Air Data Commons. So it is a central core hub for finding data in the Air Data Commons. 
So I'm going to tongue in cheek pause for questions because um, the immediate question you might ask is, Brian, you only talked about four of the uh, five trust principles. And I didn't talk about sustainability because um, I think that is really the hardest and most challenging, um, in particular, if you have a strong community behind you, several of, most of the trust principles are, are, I think, manageable, but I think sustainability is really, really hard. Um, and I think it's one of the key things that I think this community, I think, needs to talk about. Um, just give a context really quickly. Um, so we're a long live research project. We've been under development since 2013. We have broad funding from many resources over so many years. We've got broad community support. We've got a big user base. And we're doing, I think, really relevant and, and, and interesting and critical work right now in helping researchers share COVID-19 T cell and B cell data. Um, so all of that is really, really good and promising. So what is the problem you might ask? Well, like most research repositories, um, we don't know what's gonna happen when our current funding runs out. So I like to think we're a, a very fit uh, repository because we spend so much time on the funding treadmill. Um, and I think, so, so that's a really, really challenging question to ask is around how we are able to um, manage sustainability in these research repositories. And I think, Sustainability is not just about storing the data long term, it's sustaining the relevance of the data as well. And so platforms and repositories have to resolve as the research community resolve, revolve. I'm just going to wrap up with just two trust related things to, to ponder. Um, I think trustful and sustainable repositories versus trustful and sustainable air data commons are something that are worth thinking about. So in our context, if one repository goes away in the Air Data Commons, um, that is not a critical um, loss. It might be an important loss, but it's not a critical loss. Um, the Air Data Commons uh, lives on as a trusted resource. And that Data Commons is the real value to the community, not the single repository. The other thing I wanted to point out um, really quickly is that we have um, but I consider primary and secondary data. So the primary data requires trust um, and sustainability. We need to store that primary data for long periods of time. The RSeq data that we store is process data, that's secondary data. And so that data is, is and should be re reproducible from that primary data. And our secondary data is really, really, really useful to research doing active science. But how important is it that that be archived long term, and so I think there's an inter some interesting questions to ask about how the trust principles apply to secondary data as opposed to primary data, and whether there's any differences there. And on that note, I'll wrap up. Some acknowledgments of our funders and collaborators, of which we could not do this work without. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Brian and, and Raina. It's always interesting not just to hear how specific domains are handling some of these uh, trust uh, principles, but also the complexity of the data and how it leads to a different lens to view things like sustainability. So thank you both very much. Uh, we're running about um, 10 minutes late. So what I'm going to suggest is that we continue uh, with our agenda before the break. And uh, I, so I'm going to introduce our next two colleagues together because uh, they are going to pass the uh, baton back and forth. Um, and once uh, Lee and Corinne are done, then we will, uh, we will have our, our break and I'll figure out where we are time-wise, but we may uh, move it down to a, a 10 minute break to make sure people have a chance to, to do what they need to do during that break. Um, so Lee Wilson, Lee is, uh, is one of our two presenters. Lee is the service manager for Portage, the national library-based network launched by the Canadian Association of Research Libraries, or CARL, uh, with the goal of building capacity and coordinating research data management activities in Canada, and is currently funded by the new Digital Research Infrastructure Organization, or as we affectionately call INRIO. Um, Corinne is a recent uh, arrival at the uh, Portage 
team. She's a project officer at the at Portage. She's a library information management and archives professional, experienced in digital archives management and preservation, and she also holds law law degrees in civil and common law. A great combo. So over to you, Lee and Corinne. Thanks, Mark. Uh, first, I'd like to just thank the organizers of this event for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, for our portion of the symposium, Corinne and I will be providing a, a sort of a broad overview of data repositories in the Canadian context, so sort of a 10,000 feet view, uh, and the efforts being undertaken by Portage and other partners in this space to promote and establish the trust principles in Canada. Uh, next slide, please. So we are here representing the Portage Network, which is an initiative of the Canadian Association of Research Libraries that was launched in 2015. Portage is dedicated to the shared stewardship of research data in Canada through the development of a national research data culture, by fostering a community of practice for research data, and by building national research data services and infrastructure. And we do this work through our network of experts and with infrastructure partners to provide training, tools and services to the Canadian researcher community. Portage through Carl and alongside Research Data Canada has endorsed the trust principles as well. Uh, next slide, please. The network of experts is critical in all the work that we do. It helps us to develop resources, provide expert advice and practical help to assist with the management of research data at every stage of the life cycle. And our expert groups and working groups touch on things like data curation, planning, discovery, preservation, sensitive data, and repositories. We also have a research intelligence expert group that sort of sits above all of this uh, and is dedicated to increasing our understanding of the ecosystem and its needs through tools like surveys and environmental scanning exercises. Our uh, the experts that uh, populate our network include librarians, data management professionals, as well as institutional research officers and members of government and NGO organization or non-governmental organizations. Since it began in 2015, the network of experts has grown to include over 130 experts across 60 organizations. Uh, next slide, please. So today I'll be speaking primarily to work being done by the Further Discovery Service Working Group and the Data Repositories Expert Group. Next slide. In order to start implementing the trust principles broadly within Canada, we need to first understand the existing Canadian data repository ecosystem, which has a very long history of, operate, of operations, um, but those operations have occurred in sort of a patchwork fashion with repositories serving well the needs of their individual communities, but oftentimes this work has been done within silos um, and indeed within funding silos as well. The Federated Research Data Repository or FERDER Discovery Service Working Group is currently engaged in an environmental scanning project to try to better understand the Canadian repository landscape. The raw data for this analysis was derived from RE3 data, fair sharing, and other repository registries and sources. The working group members investigated the over 350 repositories within this data set, tagged as Canadian, and uh, within these systems to find entries that were one, act actually Canadian, um, there were several that, that weren't, um, active, which is defined here as still being actively maintained and in operation, and whether they were data repositories in sort of the traditional sense versus other kinds of platforms such as databases, data centers, project websites, or data management platforms. Essentially, the question was, were they online repositories that maintain and steward and publish data sets along with metadata? This slide represents some preliminary findings from this work. And while the figures show only current best estimates based on our early data analysis, they do provide a useful picture of the richness and diversity that exists within the Canadian repository ecosystem. So according to our findings, there are approximately 238 active data repositories in Canada. 112 are government repositories that have what we call a generalist focus which means that they accept any and all types of research data. 
56 are institutional data repositories with a generalist focus. 70 are domain-specific repositories or repositories that have a particular disciplinary or domain or subject-specific focus. And of the subset, 35 are government repositories with a specific domain focus or topic, and 35 are domain-specific repositories from research organizations. So for example, Ocean Networks Canada. Next slide, please. In addition to trying to gain a clear picture of the current repository landscape so that we can connect, connect with and provide better supports to these important research platforms, the Environmental Scanning Project aims to identify repositories that will be suitable, uh, suitable for indexing within, the, within FERDER, uh, Canada's National Metadata Aggregation Service. So broadly speaking, as a national uh, discovery layer, FERDER's goal is to make Canadian research data more fair, but as Ingrid and others have suggested today, fair and trust are so closely linked, this means that our efforts are also helping in the movement towards a more trustworthy repository ecosystem. FERDER's national discovery layer has several benefits, both for researchers and the repository community writ large. We've developed a custom metadata harvester to work with different platforms and standards, allowing us to aggregate metadata, uh, metadata from different repositories. This improves the discovery of Canadian research data by making metadata findable within a single search interface. And thinking about the trust principles, this helps to increase the transparency of repository holdings in Canada, as well as touching on the user focus aspect of trust. Instead of having to search multiple locations, a researcher can use FERDER as a community catalog to search across all of the repositories we harvest. The harvester itself represents the technology T in trust by providing infrastructure to create interoperability between disparate repository platforms and technologies. FERDER also benefits existing repository sites by driving traffic back to them, since each search result within FERDER will link back to an original data source. These clear ties back to the source repository helps to promote the responsibility component of trust by clearly demonstrating the authenticity of individual uh, repositories data holdings. Finally, thinking again about the transparency in trust, we're able to use the index that we've created to provide a metadata feed to international aggregators as well as Canadian partners. FERDER's metadata will be included soon within the open air research graph with, which is an EU initiative and one of the largest open access collections of research outputs. We also provide a feed to the Data Citation Index, which is part of the Web of Science, as well as the ProQuest, ProQuest Central Discovery Index. And in practice, what this means is that Canadian university libraries will be able to make use of FERDER's open OAI PMH feed to expose further records within their own search systems. And this is something that's currently being explored by uh, the University of British Columbia. Next slide, please. So here's a brief overview of what data is discoverable within FERDER. Currently, we harvest over 70 research data repositories, and these include university repositories, government repositories, and various domain-specific repositories, as well as data sets that are directly deposited within FERDER's own repository. So just to give you some examples, university repositories within FERDER include Scholars Portal Dataverses, as well as other institutional repositories. For institutional repositories, which include a mix of data sets, publications, and other resources, as an example, UBC's Circle repository, we will filter out just the data sets for inclusion within FERDER. We also harvest government repositories, including the Federal Open Government Portal, provincial data portals, as well as a growing number of municipal data portals. Domain-specific repositories in FERDER include data repositories from several research centers like DataStream and the Canadian Integrated Ocean Observing System. And finally, we, have, we currently have over 140 data sets that are deposited and stewarded uh, directly within FERDER that are also accessible within our discovery interface. Next slide, please. Here's a breakdown of FERDER's sectoral coverage. While most of our partnering repositories come from university libraries, we're also connecting with a number of domain-specific and government repositories. We expect that these numbers are going to be growing in the coming years as we identify and connect with other suitable candidates for harvesting. Next slide, please. 
So for the remainder of our presentation, we will be speaking to another initiative that's emerging out of our network of experts. To further the goal of facilitating coordination and building trust among Canadian repositories, the Data Repositories Expert Group, or DREG as it's known, brings together representatives from key repository stakeholder communities to provide high level coordination for the platform specific working groups and to bring a broad and cohesive approach to repository development in Canada. The DREG includes representation from Carl Portage and RDC, WDSITO, the Canadian Space Agency, Compute Canada, CUSE, Ocean Networks Canada, and a Scholars Portal representing a growing national instance of Dataverse and further. And now I will turn it over to Corinne, who will talk about a major initiative being led by the DREG that will help us to bring the trust principles to Canadian repositories. Thank you, Lee, and hello to everyone listening. Can you all hear me? Yes, good. Uh, yes, so I'm Kareen. Uh, as uh, Mark mentioned, I'm a project officer at Port Portage, and uh, I'm gonna be pleased to tell you about the new project they were undertaking with the oversight of the Data Repositories Expert Group that Lee has just outlined. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? So this is the first time we are speaking publicly about this project. So if you're listening today, you have the very uh, newest and latest information about this from us. Um, we're quite excited about it, at least I am. Uh, the project has come about because some folks at Portage and on the expert group saw an opportunity to support repositories um, that may be considering certification as a trusted digital repository. So whether they're doing this as a strategic ob objective uh, to gain the confidence of their stakeholders, to improve systems and processes internally, or to achieve any of the benefits that repositories that have um, pursued certification have reported. So we're calling this the Quartra Seal Repository Certification Support Pilot Project. And that is a mouthful, but the um, key word in there, I would say is support. That is really gonna be our role in this. Uh, we wanna support repositories that are pursuing certification or at least pursuing um, compliance, closer compliance with uh, the Quartra Seal certification requirements, um, whether uh, those are finally uh, achieved during the process of the project or not. Um, so just to provide some context on repositories in Canada, uh, repository certification, as, um, as many of you will know, is nothing new. Uh, we've had the open archival in information system model around for a very long time. There have been, there's a whole ecosystem that Ingrid referred to of repository certifications. As far as Cortra Seal and its predecessors, um, on the Quartra Seal website, you can see um, all of the repositories that have achieved, achieved Quartra Seal, as well as both of the predecessor certifications. In Canada, um, we currently have no repositories that are Quartra Seal certified. We do have three um, that previously achieved the World Data System certification, including Reina's um, organization, Ocean Networks Canada. The other two in that group were the uh, Canadian Astronomy Data Center and the Canadian Cryospheric Information Network. Um, so we don't currently have information on how many repositories could be interested or are planning to pursue or are pursuing certification, um, but we hope to find out uh, a little bit about that um, through this project and to support repositories that might be interested in doing that. So against that backdrop, we at Portage and on the Data Repositories Expert Group see this project as a way to advance the trust principles and strengthen repositories in Canada by supporting a designated cohort of repositories in progressing toward compliance with the Quartra Seal certification requirements and achieving certification where it's feasible in the timeframe of the project. Um, Quartra Seal is a certification we have chosen for a couple of reasons. Um, it's probably evident by now that it's a community recognized certification that has gained significant uptake worldwide. And as a core level of certification, it's comparatively less resource intensive than extended or formal certifications to implement. Um, but it can also be used as a foundation for um, pursuing those further levels of certification should the repositories wish to do that. Uh, we can go to the next slide, please. 
So this will be the first time we undertake this kind of support project for repository certification in Canada, but we do have some successful models to look for uh, to look to for inspiration. So there have been successful projects undertaken in Europe, um, one of which uh, Ingrid's organization was an important partner, and also in Australia. So the idea for our project is that we would like to provide both funding and direct support for a series of objectives. First, we would like to provide um, a little bit of additional openly available training um, before the main part of the project proceeds on repository certification in core trust seal. So look out for a webinar um, that we will be organizing in December that will be openly available. Um, next, we'll be putting out a call for applications and undertaking a selection process for repositories that would form the cohort for this pilot project. With the cohort assembled, we'll provide coordination and facilitated workshops through which participants will complete the self-assessment that is the foundation of the Quartra SEAL certification process. In addition to providing um, coordination and support, we'll fund the administrative fee um, that someone mentioned is a uh, thousand euros for three years, um, the three years that the certification is valid um, for those repositories that do um, submit their uh, application and um, go through the assessment process. Um, we, uh, we also expect to um, possibly have some funding available to support participants in filling gaps they identify during the self-assessment. We're still working at the details of that. Um, through the pilot, we also hope to build a community of repositories that will be able to advise and support other Canadian repositories um, that might seek certification in the future. And as a final objective, um, the self-assessment self and application process um, should allow participants the opportunity to provide feedback to Core Trust Seal that can then feed into this community-driven uh, standard. Uh, slide, please. So this is just the rough timeline that we have envisioned. Uh, we're currently in the project launch phase, which means for now the planning phase. Um, early in the new year, you can expect to see the call for applications issued through various channels. Our selection committee will be convening uh, at that point um, to review the applications and uh, complete the selection by the end of March. Uh, the bulk of the work of self-assessment will take place um, from April to December of next year. Self-assessment requires repositories to coordinate internally with various offices and experts that can best address the 16 criteria that are part of the core trust seal self-assessment. So, um, and then during that period, repositories that are ready to do so can submit to their applications to um, core trust seal. So the timing of, um, for each of that process for each repository will vary. Um, we would expect applications to be submitted by the end of the year and um, repositories to be responding to feedback from their assessors, um, possibly early in the following year. Um, there can be several cycles of feedback and revision. Um, and then ideally with, the, uh, with this initial cohort, we would um, anticipate being able to do a project review and close the project. Um, in March of 2022. And uh, those are the essentials of the project. So next slide. Uh, as I said, our planning is currently underway. So if you have questions or suggestions at this time, uh, we welcome those. And otherwise look, up for, look out for a follow-up uh, webinar in December and a call for applications early in the new year. Thank you. Thanks to you both, uh, Trin and, and Lee. It's uh, nice to see this project emerging uh, as a member of DRAG. I've been part of the conversation and it's very gratifying to see the, uh, the work coming, uh, coming to fruition and, and to see a launch coming up soon. So thanks to you both for that information. Uh, so we're about just under 15 minutes uh, over time. So what I'm going to suggest is that we'll take a 10 minute break um, and return. So let's return for 20 to the hour. Um, so I'm not going to say which hour because everybody's in a different time zone. Uh, so 20 to the hour, we'll get started back with our panel. And uh, so we're just going to use up a little bit of the time uh, for the group discussion at the end. So the webinar is scheduled to go for another hour. Um, and so we will come back with our panel. I do notice also that there are a couple of questions in the Q&A. 
So we may well have a chance to insert those into the panel discussion, but if not, we will definitely get to them at the end. Uh, so we have four panelists, as you can see on the slide, uh, coming up. So we will see you back at uh, 20 to the hour in just about 12 minutes. And of course, feel free to stay logged in. It's probably a lot easier to stay logged in and, and uh, mute yourself than uh, to log back in again.
so we're just uh, coming close to the end of the break. We'll get started again in about three minutes. Uh, I would note that for people that are still on, there are um, a number of conversations in some cases and responses to some of the questions in the Q&A panel. So hopefully you're all able to see those. Mark, uh, this is Dawi. Uh, do, you, do you still hear me okay? okay? Yep. Jeff, do you want to try your audio? Sure. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. Uh, Mike, do you want to, whenever you're ready, try your audio and video? Video is good. Uh, Karen, how are you doing with, uh, we've got your video. Go ahead and say something. Yeah, you, have you got my audio? Yeah, you're good to go. That's a tough question in the chat window. <laughs> you mean the um, anonymous attendee one? Yep. Yeah, I was actually, um, I suppose I could have given our panelists a heads up, but I was actually thinking of putting that one out there maybe for the panelists. I don't know if I'll make it the first one, but so you may want to give it a read. Sorry, Mark. I, Mike, I you've got audio. Can you? Uh... Sure, I will uh, put it into the into the chat. Thank you. <clears throat> I think it's basically getting at the use of data and or abuse of data, if you wish. Um, I won't go there for the first question, but a nice softball question to get us started. <laughs> so I think we're probably good to go. We've only got a few seconds uh, before 20 to the hour. Um, so uh, welcome back, everyone. Um, I am going to introduce all of our panelists in one go. And then I'm going to push them right over the cliff and ask them the first question <laughs> as a way to get us started because I know some of our, a couple of our panelists uh, will have to uh, leave uh, before the uh, half hour is done. So please feel free to continue to add questions to Q&A because we'll probably just do a natural pivot from the panel directly into the discussion at the end. Um, and uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and introduce folks. So our first panelist, Dawei Lin, is a computational biologist turned data science official plays a key role in the Division of Allergy Immunology and Transplantation at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease, or NIH as it's known, uh, and the NIH in developing data strategies, executing them and implementing data science related programs. He is also a member of the board of the Core Trust Seal and a co-chair of the RDA WDS Certification of Digital Repositories Interest Group. Um, our second panelist is Karen Payne, Karen is the Associate Director for International Technology for the World Data System based in Western Canada. <clears throat> and uh, Karen is also a colleague. We participated together last week on a global open research commons, Birds of a Feather, to talk about uh, how to develop uh, benchmarking for global research infrastructures. 
Our third panelist is Mike Smith. Uh, Dr. Smith's a professor in the School of Information Management at the, in the Faculty of Management at Dalhousie University. Uh, Mike is a computer scientist uh, by background and is currently um, studying the intersection of people, information, and technology. This includes research challenges in using cloud computing uh, tool support for research dissemination and discovery. Uh, he has a, I would say, a focus on oceans data management and scientific information portals uh, and management. Uh, he's also interested in management of cloud scale data, leveraging IT to meet research and educational needs and enabling open data and data literacy. And our final panelist is, is Jeff Moon, who's the director of Portage. And you've heard a bit about Portage with our uh, previous speakers. Portage is a national library-based network, uh, which was launched by the Canadian Association of Research Libraries with the goal of building capacity and coordinating research data management activities in Canada. And also, as you heard when I introduced Lee and Corinne, it is funded by the new Digital Research Infrastructure Organization, or INDRIO. So many thanks to our four panelists for joining the call today. And as I mentioned uh, earlier, a couple of our panelists, Karen and Dawei, for example, were part of the uh, original trust mm -hmm. symposium. So uh, I do appreciate um, their uh, continuing uh, and getting involved in this uh, second version of the, uh, of the session. So I'm gonna kind of open it and just ask each of the panelists for a few uh, comments uh, given your community context, because uh, each of you comes from a different context, what do you see as the biggest opportunity and the biggest challenge to moving to a strong intersection with the trust principles? And maybe we'll start uh, with you, Dawe, as one of the authors of the trust article. Okay, yeah. Th thanks, Mark. And uh, also thanks uh, your colleagues to organize this wonderful symposium. And uh, it was great to see like so many people interested in the trust now and trying to uh, give uh, detailed examples how they implement it. So I, I'm pretty inspired. Uh, regarding the question, I think that I'm from uh, a biomedical uh, field. And uh, I think the, uh, the, the biggest challenge is the data that we have is really becoming seem big. And uh, I think the, some prediction that in like in the few years, probably the human genome data will be more than YouTube and uh, and then like Google and 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 Twitter like combine. So that's sort of like the the era we're living. But uh, I think the value part is also important. Like you know, how can we learn from everybody, every patient, and then apply that to um, to the um, to 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 benefit you know uh, each person. So so in that I think is is kind of related to the trust. Like you know, we need the data to be a community data. Like, you know, they, they, they need to work together. You know, everybody's knowledge can, can be combined. And, uh, and then the trust, I think, is the, uh, I think the, the result of speakers mentioned about that, you know, like different aspect of the trust, you know, the technology can have to need to be scalable. Uh, and, uh, and then the infrastructure need to be sustainable. <laughs> and, uh, and then that can satisfy the user's need. Uh, and, um, I feel that you know the transparency and the responsibility that are the ones that uh, kind of engage the uh, the service providers uh, to help that realize the uh, the vision that uh, the knowledge that we learn from the patients will be able to um, to help to benefit the, the community. So I will stop there. Um, okay. Thanks, Dawei. So lots of challenges in the health data context, just with sheer volume and and being able to uh, make the best use of that. Um, Jeff, would you like to go next? Biggest challenge from your perspective in an intersection with the trust principles? So we're focusing on the challenges right now, uh, Mark? Yeah, like one, okay. what do you see as one sure. big challenge? Sure, I mean, I think that we are on a trajectory toward an intersection with trust principles and frankly, the core trust seal at the same time. Um, and aligning these at the institutional level with the major RDM policy initiatives in Canada presents a bit of a challenge to me. So on the one hand, we have the, the core trust seal and its mission and scope requirements that have a data preservation and access um, piece that looks at uh, institutions and organizations posting an approved public mission statement. 
which is perhaps somewhat analogous with the um, tri agencies requirement for institutional RDM strategies to be publicly posted um, for funding to flow. Um, under transparency and trust, um, we have specific repository services and data holdings that are verifiable by public, publicly accessible evidence. And that seems a little bit stronger to me. Um, but in any case, the challenge I think will be getting institutions to actually buying into this ethos and to be bold and specific in their statements mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. follow it through with concrete and practical actions mm -hmm. in support of trustworthy repositories and their use by researchers. So I think it's really that connection with policies that have teeth. Yeah, great comments, uh, Jeff. And it, and it comes home, I think, in the current context where we have seen a, a delay in the implementation of the tri-agency policy. So that, uh, that's certainly our uh, important consideration. Um, Mike, do you want to go again, the challenge from your context in terms of intersecting with the trust principle? Yeah, and, and I'm interesting because I my my context is is twofold, right? With my Mio Paranoa if I had on, I'm concerned with supporting researchers as they look to deposit their data and make their data available to the world, uh, either because they're personally motivated or extrinsically motivated by someone bearing a big stick, who by the way, sometimes also me. Um, and then on the other side, my context is uh, uh, as as a um, I don't know what I, how to describe what I do as one of the leads for the Canadian Integrated Ocean Observing System. Of course, I'm also um, building a repository. And I, I think that's, that's uh, a little bit more wha what you had in mind when inviting me here. But I think reflecting on both contexts is useful. Uh, and so my, my challenge on the repository side is, is operationalizing this, right? And, and, and one of the challenges, I think, is that um, principles don't really have a scope. It's easy to say that lots of things are are implicated by a particular principle, and and so how far you go in terms of asserting and 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 changing and and um, doing things that meet the, the 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 broad umbrella of these principles is, uh, I think, a challenge for us, right? And mm -hmm. you know, are are we aiming for minimally minimally satisfactory? Are we aiming to do a robust um, compliance uh, or a, a robust uh, demonstration of, of how we fit. And, and I think ultimately it will be the users that, that drive the, the level to which we, we implement these principles. And it'll be their expectations, I think, that drive it. And, and so as I, as I think about this in the context of supporting people looking for repositories, um, it, it's interesting, right? Because if you know, even just to take the the T, right? If you look at transparency, um, and and the specific repository services, the the things that I might think of as a repository are things that I need to demonstrate, um, and including um, the duration of time in which I'm prepared to digitally preserve research data. Mm -hmm. uh, the the user might have very very different interest, right? Uh, and if you think about how researchers would choose to publish an article in a journal, their questions are going to be, how many people are downloading data sets from this repository? How many people are searching for this repository? Is your repository indexed by some of the major aggregation systems across the, the world or across the country? Um, do, do I get a DOI? Do my colleagues publish here? Will people find my data if I go here? And, and so they're, they're the, I think the challenge from the user perspective will be the potential for this disconnect between the things that repositories think are important to be transparent or responsible or sustainable um, and, and the things that users think are important. And so we're gonna rely really heavily on that user focus piece, right? That you and trust become so important as we try to align what repositories care about with what users care about um, and, and users don't know what to care about yet. And, and the trust principles, I, I hope, will guide them in that. Well, that's a, maybe a, an important challenge back to, to us, Mike, and the DREG in general, as we roll this pilot project forward, is to try to translate those trust principles and the core trust seal certification uh, requirements into a user-focused language and be able to respond to those uh, user interests and requirements. Uh, Karen, any thoughts on from your context on the challenges in intersecting with the trust principle? 
Yeah, I think um, I think what to, to me what's interesting is how principles like trust and fair, you know, developed initially for data repositories and data um, get extended to other entities. Um, so you have discussions about fair software, fair semantics, um, trust for virtual research environments. And I think that going forward, um, when applying those principles to different types of scholarly outputs, um, there's a lot of technology challenges associated with that. So you're hearing conversations now about how to archive electronic um, lab notebooks, which is really tricky because if they, if they rely on um, outside services, um, then how can we ensure that those notebooks can be rerun in the future if um, an existing API or service didn't survive. Um, and I know that there are, you know, projects like Binder that are working towards packaging the computing environments, but if, if the solution requires access to HPC systems, which tend to be pretty closed, then, that, then those remote connections are not allowed, it could be really tricky. So I just think all of those interest, you know, issues are sort of interrelated and as our, um, as we examine our reward systems for rewarding scholarly work and our work environments, um, th there's going to be a lot of challenges there making them work. And what I heard Brian say was that, you know, with the eye receptor approach is that they've been able to create solutions with Binder. Um, I don't mean to speak for him, so I could be wrong about that. But so there's certainly a lot of promise in that well-organized communities um, can create workable solutions. Um, but the reuse across communities, I think, um, and internationally is going to be really challenging, but also really, really rewarding and really interesting, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Karen. And, and um, if any of the other speakers want to make a comment on any of the, the comments that are made, then uh, please feel free to, to turn your video on and unmute yourself and uh, interrupt. Um, so this kind of builds on, on a number of the comments made and especially some of the comments that Mike made. Um, and I'm going to, uh, again, I'll pick on somebody first, but the question is, can you comment on the difference between adhering to a set of principle, uh, as in trust, and uh, having a seal, as in a core trust seal? Um, so maybe, uh, Karen, I'm picking on you first. Did you, did you want to take a stab at that one? Uh, you're muted. The The question is the difference between um, core trust seal and the trust principles. Is that what you Yeah, mean? and maybe not so much necessarily what's the difference between adhering to a set of principles and having a seal, mm -hmm. uh, but any comments that you might have about those two different things from your perspective or your community's perspective. Any thoughts there? And you, you can go second if you want. <laughs> yeah, so maybe... Uh, uh, I, Mark, I, I think um, maybe I can jump in because sure. I think this is a very important question. And uh, I think we talked a little bit about the, the same issues uh, last time, uh, you know, with the, the, uh, the main uh, trust symposium. Yeah. And I think the, uh, I really like uh, Vim Hugo, uh, they uh, gave the classification. Like there is a three, three sort of levels, if you think about it. like, you know, trust and fair are aspirational principles. Like, you know, they gave people the, the direction to go, but, but not necessarily uh, at least a lot of details. And, uh, and then the second level is the framework. Like say you, you probably wanna have the repository standards or maybe like for FAIR, you have FAIR standards uh, out there, right? So, the, and also the, I think the, um, I think of Mac, uh, uh, comments about like, you know, what, what the user wants, you know, there is actually, there is now like, Alexi like NIH have this, this desirable characteristics of, uh, of repositories, you know, what, what is the, the features like people want to have. So that's kind of like, there is a framework to define what, what is the, uh, what is the, uh, the implementation may look like. And then the third level is the implementation, like, you know, that the, the people have to look into the, uh, check the details, the publications are uh, available documents that to see if any uh, of their operations that satisfy the standards or satisfy the criteria that the, the, their community wants. So there was a, a kind of the, I think Kotra seal is uh, at, the, at the implementation level. Right. Like, you know, the people 
from peers actually will read all the application materials and then to make sure I like to check what the, what level they're at. You know, I, I think as uh, Rina said, like, you know, they have the three or four in order to be certified, right? So, so I think there, uh, I think that framework is, um, is good to think about. Like, you know, we're not like say, uh, I think there also, I saw like the, uh, the comment in, um, in the chat box is, you know, like say, are you, like, if you endorse trust, are you trustworthy? <laughs> are you be trusted by, you know, by yeah. the, uh, the community? I think it's, Kind of different question. I think the trust is the guideline again, like inspiration, uh, inspiration, like for people to be trustworthy. But the in if you are trusted by your community or not is kind of the at the implementation level people can look into. So so those are like the the three categories. Maybe that can help uh, you know the discussion later on. Okay, I would um I think that is right on the money in terms of the trust being an aspirational uh, idea with core trust seal being um, more implementation oriented. And I would also um, commend core trust seal in recognizing that um, getting to become a trustworthy repository, it doesn't happen all in one fell swoop. And, I, and if I'm not mistaken, I don't think I'm speaking out of turn when I say that I think they're working on um, preliminary or partial certifications, sort of tiers of certification to help um, engage the community and really support them and make it uh, a little more digestible to get to where they're trying to go as well. Um, and maybe before Mike or Jeff go, I'm just gonna pull out a comment from in the chat from Patrick. And Karen, I think it partly comes back to your earlier comments about some binder and some of the others. And that is, do you see any solution to providing a solution for machine learning data and systems in these archives because of the way machine learning tweaks live parameters of, of the data and, and all of the stuff that may not be well captured in any kind of archival context. Is that, that's a particularly interesting, I think, example of, of a combination of data and code and, and algorithms and how one would potentially approach that in a, an archival preservation context. Um, so the, the issue is that if you rerun um, an AI or machine learning algorithm, um, it won't necessarily come out, come out with the same right. solution twice. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's just the function of the nature of the algorithm. You know, if there are genetic algorithms or, um, you know, neural networks even, um, for sure, that, that's, that's an issue. But that would be a true whether or not there are counts, right? I mean, that's just the nature of the simulation. You'd have to run you know, thousands and thousands of simulations do a Monte Carlo simulation in order to try to converge on a, um, on a solution for that. So yeah. I, I don't think that's a technical issue. I feel like that's in the nature of the algorithm. Um, and I see, Brian, did you want to comment on that or? Yeah, I mean, I just, just it comes down to that a little bit, the, the question I raised about secondary versus primary data. Um, both require fairness and trust but they're, they are slightly different, right? So the, the data that we store, the AirSeq data, it's not the primary data. It's the primary data, sequence data that lives at NCBI. That's archived well, forever, as long as NCBI is around. Mm -hmm. um, but the value add of the AirSeq data is process data that's really valuable for science to happen quickly and efficiently. That data needs to be trusted, but it doesn't necessarily need the longevity or the sustainability that that primary data does, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I kind of feel that there's the trust principles apply in different ways to different types of data. So the output of machine learning, like a machine learning out run might be valuable for somebody to refer to later, but it might not be considered primary data and therefore have all of the same trust criteria yeah. applied to it. Or be, yeah, absolutely. Um, Mike or Jeff, any comments on that question of uh, the difference between the principles and the seal? Uh, I'll pick up on, the, on this ML question for a second too, because it relates to a problem I struggle with, which is um, ocean modeling. Anytime you're running a, a large model that's trying to predict or even, even hindcast, um, ocean conditions, there, there's a, an element of, they're, they're somewhat stochastic, right? That, that in the end they converge on the same kind of answer, but 
what they project for Tuesday of next week might be slightly different. And, mm -hmm. and we really struggle with how do we capture and, and document this model output and are we, are we trying to archive the software? And if, if what we're trying to do is capture the software, we probably also need to capture the environment in which that software is running. And, and now you have a, a fairly large software engineering problem in, in, in terms of making that software uh, um, reusable in itself. So there's a, this is absolutely, a, as far as I can tell, a, a very open question that we're still trying to figure out. There's a really interesting um, Yale project that was looking at this at Yale Libraries, and I'm, I'm sure there's been others, but there's no kind of turnkey solution to this yet. So uh, definitely interesting to think about it applied in the context of machine learning. Look, look to the question of, of what's different about um, certification versus principles. To, to me, it's um, uh, the difference between telling someone what to look for in a good plumber and recommending a plumber to someone. Right, I, I, it, it, uh, if, if you have unique plumbing needs, you really want the principles because you need to undertake that assessment yourself. But providing people a rubric does require that they then do that assessment themselves to go through the items and say, this is a good thing. Um, so, so from a user perspective, right, the, the, the having the, the seal does, does a lot of value because there's kind of a shorthand there that says someone who's not you, who's an expert, has assessed it and it meets these needs or it meets these, these expectations. And the, the time when that doesn't become helpful is, is when your needs are somewhat different than, than what that, that core certification is, is trying to document. And so the, the conceit of any certification is that we have captured the things that, that you should care about. Mm -hmm. um, to me, as a, as a repository, uh, I, I like the, the certainty of the certification, right? In that uh, I'm assessed once and I know what the result is. Uh, with principles, I, I have something to work toward, but I'm not sure if the, in the eye of the beholder, if I've achieved that, right? And, and uh, uh, someone, and I'm sorry, I've already forgotten the name, commented earlier that you know, if, if we do all of this and at the end users don't trust the repository, then, then you haven't really met these trust principles. And, mm -hmm. and so knowing what that threshold is, is, is challenging for me as, as a repository. Yeah, great thoughts. Thanks, Mike. I, and Jeff? I really like the way that um, Dawei framed the fair and trust principles as being aspirational. I think that's, that's a really good way of framing it. And you work down to the, the implementation in the core trust seal context. I've, I've always found it a little bit odd that if I've got the chronology correct, the advent of, of core trust seal and prior to that, the data seal of approval predates formal development of the trust principles. But practically speaking, they've always been there. It's not like they weren't there. It's just they weren't articulated. Um, but I think the ability for us to um, adopt uh, the trust principles and endorse them um, will only help us um, as we continue to work toward core trust seal certification with the pilot that Portage is involved in, um, throughout all of that, we're going to be principles compliant, even though we're striving to meet the very specific criteria of core trust seal. So, yeah, yeah. Mark, can I add uh, another comment on, on uh -huh. the this? I think I think the uh, I, I just want to go back to I think what the, uh, Ingrid mentioned before, like you know what, what exactly the motivation to come up. The trust, right? I think the uh, the the real. Uh, I think uh, I mean there. We can receive a lot of comments, and um, and I think the real motivation is that the the digital repository community need to have a unified message. Say you know the repository has value, and this value need to be recognized, and so that message need to be very clear to, um, to the founders, for example, right? Uh, we're talking about responsibility that they, they need to be uh, like, you know, that trust need to be in their vocabularies of discussions and their investment. So I think they, you know, we have, a lot, I think a lot of standards, a lot of uh, best practices out there, right? But I think they all need to make one point that repository is a, a, a very important infrastructure for the data ecosystem. I think that that motivation um, need to be clarified. I think I think that's you know like if we talk about the another aspect of the certification and and trust is like trust also is a messaging 
and the re repository is the one that you find a good plumber. So I, I like that analogy as well. <laughs> Yeah, it's a it's a good analogy. I haven't I haven't heard that one before. So thanks for that, Mike. <laughs> the good uh, the trust plumbing seal of approval. Um, and I'm gonna so I'm gonna ask maybe a final question, and then I'm gonna ask the other uh, speakers to turn their video and audio on because I do want to talk about next steps, and also encourage uh, folks on the call to ask any questions they might have about this emerging pilot project that uh, Corinne and Lee talked about, because I think that is an important opportunity for uh, researchers and infrastructure providers to, uh, to work together to, uh, to answer some of these questions about trusted repositories. So please feel free to uh, consider any thoughts or questions you had back when uh, Lee and uh, Corinne were presenting. So the final question is a bit more on the practical side. And as a, a research infrastructure team moving forward, maybe they go forward and they uh, put in an application to the uh, Portage and Partner uh, Pilot Project for Core Trust Seal. And going forward in that context, what's your what are your thoughts on whether the trust principles and a Core Trust Seal does it suggest largely a change in policy, staffing? standards compliance, training, infrastructure, all of the above. In your experiences, does one of those kind of rise to the top or is it uh, very dependent on individual use cases? And I'll throw that out. Anybody who wants to unmute and respond, feel free. And again, I would encourage Reina, Brian, Ingrid, uh, Lee and Corinne to weigh in uh, from here on as well. Any thoughts on what achieving core trust seal or adhering to the trust means in terms of that operational context? Mm. Uh, so maybe I will go first since like I didn't see other people unmute. Uh, I think that uh, uh, at least from the um, from the NIH perspective, I think the, the trust uh, and, uh, and the certification already have impacted the policy uh, changes. Uh, they uh, this year uh, we issued two funding opportunities to just fund repositories. It used to be like repository is part of the research grant for NIH, and NIH's mission is to encourage uh, innovations and applied knowledge to uh, to improve public health. But I think the sustainability, like maintain the resources, that was not before a focus, but now it is. I think in the funding opportunities, it mentioned that, you know, the repository need to be trustworthy. I think that's kind of the things that we, uh, I think uh, I was happy to see, like, you know, that vocabulary is already in the policy uh, uh, documents. Uh, and uh, and I think that that's also kind of have the ramification that, that like the, if, if you want to run a repository, right, you want to make sure you have enough uh, uh, resources to support your infrastructure, support your staff to make sure that you are uh, trustworthy and, and, uh, and maintainable. Uh, and then one, one more thing I wanna add is that actually this is also a question that was discussed at the uh, RDA uh, the repository certification interest group. Uh, and uh, so we, um, so I have a survey actually for the 33 endorsers for the trust principle uh, to see what they see the impacts that they have uh, like what, after they endorse the trust principles, uh, I I cannot you know I don't have time to talk detail, but I will kind of uh, refer you to that uh, recordings and probably like the report after that. Basically, I think there was there was a, like very positive impact from the uh, from the endorsers. And those for people that didn't register for the RDA plenary last week, um, you will be able to access all of the recordings. I think in the start of December. Okay. <clears throat> there is a period where of those that registered and attended have access, uh, but then they'll be publicly accessible. Anybody else want to have a comment on this kind of more operational yeah. aspect? I have Brian and then Jeff. Yeah. And so, so my comment, I think, so I, you know, as a repository provider, I've looked at the trust core seal and decided whether I want to go down the road or not. Um, and I think a lot of it is whether you have 
if you need that to acquire the trust of your community. Um, and so in our case, our community is the air community and we work really, really closely with the air community. So I feel that I have trust in quotes um, without the core trust seal. But I think that's probably a um, not the general case. I think our community is just really, really closely knit and it's very, very focused. Um, and so we have that without the core trust seal. So I think it, it kind of depends on what you need to get the trust of your community yeah. and how far down that road you need to go. Yeah, good point. We have a small community and a tight community. Uh, Jeff, and then... Yeah, that, that, that's a great segue because I, I think that's true for certain disciplinary tribes, if I can say it that way. But for others, it's, it's, a, lot, it's a lot less the case. I think trust intersects with all of the things that are listed in this question, the policy, staffing, standard compliance, training, and so on. Um, the one that I'll zoom in on circles back to the tri-agency policy again, where their language is nebulous. It's sort of, you will deposit in a recognized digital repository. Well, if, if to use somebody else's words earlier, messaging, if we can get the messaging out there through trust, through FAIR, through core trust seal, um, that this is a recognized digital repository and for these reasons, then we're going to be helping ourselves in making sure those repositories are, are supported and funded and that the researchers are using them and that the funders start recognize them as being trusty and fair and core trust seal certified. So yeah. it's policy is a big one. Um, so I have Raina and then Ingrid, I think. Okay, so I was going to just add that, um, like as a domain of repository, I actually, um, like, even though we've been really focused on engaging with our users, I still think there is a tremendous added value to having gone through the process of getting certified. Um, it, forces us, it forces us to take a hard look at all what we're doing and making sure that, um, you know, it helps us recognize our gaps and, and where we need to improve. Um, and then it's a continual process too, right? You have to be recertified. Um, to maintain your status. So um, I think that's also important. So even if you have the immediate trust and the immediate time frame with your user community, it also demonstrates that you're looking um, to the future and longer term and that um, you're, you're meaning and you're intending to, to continue to comply with whatever um, is required for, for certification over the years. And uh, you know, I imagine this is gonna get more stringent as time goes by as, as all the tools and technologies and services mature. So um, I think it just demonstrates that this is a continued effort and, and not simply dealing with the immediate um, needs. And I think it's also important to communicate to the funders, like it's all these funding right. um, awards are in you know, sh usually pretty short term intervals. And so um, it it's also serves as a communication tool and a means to um, demonstrate to those funders that we need to have longer term sustainability models for how we operate. Yeah, um, and I, 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 I was just going to jump in and say quickly that I mean, when I said I we didn't decide to go with the core seal doesn't that I didn't by any stretch mean that it wasn't valuable. In fact, I think if we were to expand our domain just a little bit, I think that need would change a lot <laughs> and i think there's a comment in the in the chat regarding pretty much just that uh from murray best uh lee maybe exactly. do you want to comment on that before ingrid goes sure thanks mark yeah just building on what reina was saying uh one of the things i'm hopeful for um for the uh the core trust seal exercise that we'll be doing um and sort of as a community thinking about about trust um, in the context of the core trust seal is that it's going to highlight the precariousness uh, of the sustainability piece. Um, so, you know, showing that so many research uh, repositories under the current funding model um, really aren't, aren't funded in a way that it, that is sustainable and it, it could be difficult for them to achieve that aspect of, of core trust seal. Um, and hopefully this process will help to show our funders that we do need better, you know, more persistent supports for these kinds of platforms beyond uncertain or cyclical grant funding cycles. Yeah, and I think that was the result with NIH as uh, Dawei suggested. Uh, Ingrid? 
Yeah, I was going to say from the perspective of my own um, institution, more or less the same as Raina just did about, you know, um, using um, Cortrasil also as a mechanism to uh, continuously improve and professionalize as a repository. And furthermore, I must say that from a European point of view, I very much recognize the, uh, the, the worry that people have around the financial sustainability of the repositories. And I'd like to say that um, a couple of years ago, we also um, had an expert group working on the wings of OECD uh, that uh, dived into the whole issue of uh, the sustainability and business models for repositories. So anyone um, who wants to... Um, look at some good recommendations that were done at that time by OECD. Please um, have a look at the report. I'll uh, try to uh, put the link in the chat. Yeah, that was uh, as one of the people that participated after the initial draft that uh, OECD report on business models for sustainable repositories is a good one. Um, so I'm maybe gonna pull this around a bit now um, and just uh, in terms of next steps, um, and I, we could always have uh, Corinne and Lee comment again on the, the goals with the pilot project, but certainly one of the next steps will be the public launch of that project, that pilot project in the call. Any, anything else that either one, Lee or Corinne, that you'd like to say in terms of next steps given the conversation that we've had or any of the questions, any specifics that you would highlight or any other comments you would make about the pending pilot project? Um, not a whole lot that wasn't already in Kareen's portion of our of our presentation. I mean, I, I think as we start to formalize what this is going to look like, we would welcome feedback from the community on what it is they would like to see us provide in terms of supports. Um, so I think we have a, a notion of, of what our funding can 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 go towards um, you know part of that is taking on the cost of, of certification itself also we want to subsidize or defray the cost of, of the work that's required to to get certification um, and we think that means providing funding to support you know partial FTEs uh, right. of, of people's times working at uh, within the repository context but but if there are other suggestions from the community I, I think we'd be really interested now to hear them mm -hmm. uh, um, I'll just add to that yeah but I've um, I've been watching all the webinars that are available on the Cordra seal site and I would recommend that anyone who's interested in pursuing uh, certification do that as well. Um, it seems to me that a lot of the um, sort of resources that are required um, setting aside like major technical improvements are staff time to do things like document workflows, write policies, write um, procedures that aren't, that are maybe in place but not written down um, because they do need to be demonstrated and so they need to be documented. And so that seems to be like a big part of the work um, that we might be able to uh, defray. Um, there's also some sort of specific technical requirements. So um, Ingrid could better speak to this, but I think uh, she mentioned that um, uh, having uh, persistent uh, identifiers implemented is a pretty important requirement that without that, you might not be able to um, achieve the level of compliance that would be needed. Um, so things like that are things that we, I think we'll be looking at um, to see if we can uh, fund those things as part of this. Um, but yeah, that's not settled yet. And just, um, anybody, yeah. Sorry, and just to highlight both uh, Corinne and Lee's comments, uh, those of you on the call who are in the Canadian community, which I think is most of us, um, I should highlight that the Andrio, the new DRI organization, is currently does currently have a call out for white papers, and the goal of that white paper process is to get a sense from the broader community in Canada what they feel the gaps are, what are the important uh, things that Andrio needs to support, and I highlight that in this at this juncture because Andrio is positioned uh, with strong user feedback and suggestions and I see that Jennifer's just put that call in the chat. Um, given user feedback, Inrio will decide how its funding will roll out over the next three to four years. 
and, and beyond. So I think this is a really useful critical juncture for people to speak up and whether it's about any of the letters in the trust principles, sustainability, whatever seems to be your, your, your uh, kind of key point. Uh, but now is the time uh, to get feedback in. Submissions are max five pages. I know there is a group in the Canadian ecosystem that's already almost finished a draft uh, on a white paper for Andrio on PIDs and highlighting what they think is a role that Andrio can play in funding uh, support for PIDs. And bear in mind that Andrio can fund up to 100% of the cost, people and infrastructure, for resources that it feels fit its mandate and meet that national uh, all important national criteria. Uh, and they can also fund less for those that are more regional, provincial focused. Um, so I just want to highlight that that's an important thing that we have in front of us. Um, and I noticed Karen and Dawe both have uh, comments. And I know Lee and Jeff have to go for a prior commitment. So thanks to you both for your participation. And uh, I'm sure we'll be seeing you again in this context very soon. Um, so I just wanted to ask, and maybe Kareen can speak to this, if there have been any discussions that they can share about the criteria they're going to use to select the cohort for the Quarter Seal certification, if there's a way to um, talk to us a bit about your thinking on how you're going to make that decision, which is going to be tough, I think. Yes, I think it will be tough too. We have had initial discussions. And um, so one thing that we think is really important is having some diversity in the um, repositories that are included. So we would want uh, disciplinary um, diversity, uh, geographic diversity in Canada. Um, we would want some repositories that were more advanced and I won't say too much because we haven't approached anyone, but perhaps some repositories that had pursued certification in the past, um, as well as re repositories that are less experienced. Um, but two factors that I think will be really important in choosing our cohort will be um, that the repositories uh, that do join um, should have a clear management support for pursuing certification because it is a significant investment. Um, so that will be important in, uh, in making sure that our, our participants can see, see the project through to the end. And, um, and then also anybody who's participating should be able to identify a person or an office um, that will be the, co the point of coordination in their organization um, because there's a lot of uh, information collection involved in, um, in, uh, in uh, addressing all of the 16 requirements. Um, it'll be important to have sort of a focused point of coordination for that. So that'll be something that we would look forward to. And then beyond that, it's up for discussion. So we welcome feedback. Yeah, good, good question and good response. Thank, thank you both. Uh, Darwin? Yeah, I think I want to share uh, some uh, NH uh, lessons learned for the next step. Uh, I think that uh, after our uh, trust principle symposium uh, workshop at NH, I think the one thing we learned is that uh, the people generally agree with this trust principle. As, as people mentioned, it's not new. It's like in every, it's kind of this principle people will follow. But what uh, NIH community, I think they did not have at the time is the vocabularies in the biomedical terms to describe what the trust is about. Mm -hmm. so, um, so that actually was helped by the Katra seal uh, is that uh, the Katra seal helped with the transparency. Like if you get the certification, all your certified evidence will be available online. And now like say for example, we have already four certified biomedical repository funded by NIH. You know, there is a lot of way of saying trust in that way. And we have a couple more uh, in the pipe that I think that once you have a critical mass and then for each community, you probably have a way to say, you know, what, what, is, the, what is the norm for your community to consider a repository is trustworthy. So that's, I think that's, that's kind of one point. The other point is that um, uh, I think uh, from a cultural seal perspective, we were, we're trying to not give the people impression that you have a certification, that certification equals to trust. Is, is that, that certification gave you a certification for you to be considered trustworthy. And then you, if you get the trust from your users or not, is not, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of it's a continuing effort, like you, 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 you earn that trust. And, uh, and then the, the final point is that, um, so the Katra seal 
And also I think the trust to advocate is the process. It's not about the content. Uh, is that even like say a repository have all the junk data, but if there's a community like that, and then uh, like to be sustained, and that can get a certification as well. It's not like the usefulness of uh, the people perceive as the value is really the process to make sure that that repository is serve their user community to offer what that whatever the users want. So that's kind of the trust uh, aspect. I, I think uh, you know I want to just clarify a little bit. No, that's very useful comments um, at this stage. And you know, as you were talking that way, I. I was looking at Brian because as somebody whose community is small and trusts the air, the eye receptor repo, it would be interesting for them to kind of translate the language of trust and the core trust seal into the uh, the eye receptor and the air community language as a good example. Um, and, uh, we, we have actually talked about that and in, in particular as eye receptor plus as an EU funded project, the trust, right. the trust, approach is i think a little bit more valuable um because it's expanding the community so. okay and i think i'm gonna maybe give uh i know ingrid you uh had a comment you wanted to make and i think we'll maybe close that with comments and then i'll just make some concluding remarks go ahead ingrid yeah i just wanted to to add to what Dave was saying because i think there is another um, level, you could say, of trust that is involved here. Um, I have been involved. Um, there are a couple of cohorts of, of um, aspiring repositories already working um, uh, around the world. So within Europe, we have seen that within a couple of uh, domain-specific research infrastructures. There is now also a cohort starting up in the national context in France, and there is one operating in Australia. And what I have seen with all of them is that it's also um, very important to create within that group of repositories that are going to work with one another. Um, also, this very trust uh, uh, worthy, trustful environment where, um, you know, there is an open atmosphere where people are willing to share um, what they are able to deliver, but maybe more importantly, what they cannot yet deliver in the framework of the trust principles or, or uh, the core trust seal requirements. Yeah. So I think through all of that layers, you know, and, and also in that process to get there itself, um, trust is really at the answers, at the essence of everything. Yeah. But that's also something to remember when you start off this group um, of uh, repositories in the call in Canada. No, that's a, a great uh, way to end the discussion. So thanks for those remarks, Ingrid. And I would like to thank everyone. Um, we're coming up to the half hour and uh, a lot of people are having to uh, drop off uh, to go on other calls. So thanks to all of our speakers, panelists, uh, Robin and uh, Kathleen and Jennifer and others who supported uh, the operational aspects of putting the webinar on. And again, I'll apologize to our French colleagues that we had technical challenges with our interpretation. Uh, we'll have to uh, make sure that, that uh, we learn a lesson from that one and can uh, make sure to deliver a strong uh, translation for the next one. So thanks again, and we all those who attended uh, will get a link to the uh, recording uh, once it's available. So thanks to you all, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks. 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 See you. Thank you.